Keep it rocked. Keep it locked. Keep, 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 it, keep it, it loud. loud. Keep it loud. You are now no. listening to the Decca Dance Radio Network, the only radio with attitude. Let's get it started. We live in a world filled with the unknown. Ghosts and spirits wander through our physical dimension. Undiscovered creatures lurk in the shadows, and strange lights and craft seem to dominate our skies. Modern science refuses to acknowledge their existence, yet credible eyewitnesses are convinced these things are real, and it's up to independent researchers to search for the truth. Welcome to Unknown Origins Radio. Thank you, Mike Ibbotson, and you're listening to another edition of Unknown Origins Radio. Tonight it's Sunday, April 24th, and I'm joined as usual by my co-host, Lauren DePinto. How are you doing, Lauren? I'm doing great, Mark. And our producer, Carrie Ann Versace. Hey, Mark. How are you? Ah, doing good. We're going to go right ahead into this because we've got a, an excellent show for you tonight. Our guests tonight are longtime researchers, and between the two of them, have authored literally dozens of books on the paranormal. Everything from ghosts to UFOs, vampires to witchcraft. Most recently, they have co-authored together a new book entitled The Vengeful Jinn, Unveiling the Hidden Agenda of Genies, which was just released in March and has already hit number one on Amazon's hot new books in parapsychology. So please join me in welcoming to the program Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip Imbrogno. How are you both doing this evening? Very good, thank you. I'm doing fine. Good. Well, thank you very much for coming on the program. And um, I have just completed reading your book, The Vengeful Gen. And uh, like most people, I think especially most people in Western society, have not been very, you know, n not having a lot of information about the gin growing up, other than what we know of from television shows like I Dream of Genie, you know, <laughs> and the blue gin. And that, I mean, literally, that's all I ever really knew about the gin until I read your book, and I found it very fascinating. So I was wondering if you can help explain to our listeners exactly what are the jinn. They're a race of um, beings that pre-existed humans. They lived here first. They are now in another dimension, and they do have abilities that we don't have. Um, they have what we would consider to be supernatural powers. They can shape-shift. They have very, very long lifespans. They are extremely intelligent. Uh, they can take a variety of forms. And some of them seem to have interests in human beings. They either become fascinated by us or they want to mess around with us. Some of them want to regain this world. And I think that uh, we are having interactions with uh, those entities in a variety of ways they're behind a lot of our paranormal experiences that we think are other entities, like demons or fairies, um, elementals, mysterious creatures, even extraterrestrials. Uh, we think the jinn, who are the hidden ones, are behind a lot of that activity for a lot of uh, their own agendas and personal interests. Now, where did information about the jinn first come from? I, I, I understand it mostly started in uh, Arabic lore, and they're mentioned in the Quran. That's right. Um, they go back to ancient times in the Middle East. They predate Islam. They were absorbed into Islam. Um, and they were uh, entities that existed in remote parts. Um, they were often called the wind demons. Uh, they were the bringers of plagues and illnesses and uh, were blamed for a lot of bad things that happened in, in a similar fashion to the role played by demons in our culture. Uh, and they're very prominent in Middle Eastern society today. In fact, uh, many people believe in them, their daily interactions with them, but they never really got absorbed into our culture. And you, you mentioned the genie, uh, the genie in the bottle. This is basically how we got to know the jinn as uh, an entity trapped in a lamp or a bottle that uh, would grant wishes if it was freed and uh, treated in our media in kind of a silly, almost goofy kind of fashion. Uh, and 
of course, we read about them in the Arabian folk tales, and they seem very distant to us, you know, imaginary uh, creatures, when actually they're quite real. Do they actually grant wishes? Of course they do. But let's put it this way. If they grant you three wishes, they'll want something in return. That's something that's been a, a sort of like a misconception about the jinn. They really don't get nothing. Something they really will not give give anything for nothing. You would have to make a deal with the jinn. And when you make your first wish and your second wish, your third wish is going to be you never you you, you never made wish one or two. Actually, they're much like people. They have different personalities. They have different likes different dislikes. Some of them believe in God, some of them do not. And uh, it depends upon what jinn you are dealing with, what personality you're dealing with. You can't look at the entire jinn race and put them under one single mentality. They're individuals, just like people. And um, some of them can be very dangerous. Some of them are not so dangerous. Most of them will not interact with humans. Some of them will interact with humans. and uh, But in order to get the three wishes, you really have to give something in return. For example, in the Middle East, they believe, and there's cases still going on that appear in the court, that a jinn will come to a you know, very young man and make a deal with the young man. Let me use your body for an unknown period of time, two weeks, let's say, and I will grant you whatever you want in return as payment. The young man says yes. See, jinn, some jinn really want to experience physical things, physical pleasures and so on. So the jinn sort of like enters the body, controls the body, is attached to the body, is in control of the body, you know, for various things like, you know, the guy may have a very young, beautiful wife and he wants to experience sex and and he goes out drinking, experiencing alcohol and all the different foods. Well, in one case, it's a real case in Saudi Arabia, this individual got into a fight in a bar and killed somebody. Well, he was arrested and brought to court and said he was possessed by a jinn. So in this situation, the jinn finally sees he's going to jail. He's got to get out of that body. So he leaves the body. And the guy wakes up back in control of his body. And he's in the courtroom, and the judge is pronouncing the death sentence on him. And he starts screaming that a jinn made him do it. And uh, they actually consider that it's sort of like the equivalent in the Western world. The devil made me do it. But um, this is the type of situation you have with jinn in the Middle East. For the most part, um, they really don't give anything unless they get something in return. And a good percentage of them, they really can't be trusted. Phil, I just want to go back to that case for a second now. So the man was perfectly aware of what was going on with the jinn? No, oh, no. So he didn't know that the like he was like his conscious was not actually there while the jinn was doing what he was doing to his body. Right. He was his conscious was asleep, and he was like in a dream state, but um, he had no recollection what the jinn was doing. And uh, when he finally regained consciousness, control of his body and his brain, he's in this courtroom, and the judge is pronouncing the death sentence on him for murder. And he goes, no, no, wait, wait, wait a minute. It wasn't me. It was a jinn. And he tells the whole story how he made the deal with the jinn, and they actually considered that. Now, in the Western world, if you did that, they would put you, that, that could get you out of the death sentence also. They would put you in a mental hospital. So in this case, you see, they consider the jinn, the idea of jinn, more real than we do of the devil. And um, they actually consider that in the case. But you see, it's against Islamic law to make a deal with the jinn. So he was put away for life. Wow. Now, what in a case like that, what is the difference between a jinn and a, a spirit? If 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 uh, it, you know if a demon or a, or a non-human entity can possess a body, and the jinn can do that, is is that saying the jinn are a spiritual being, or are they composed of some other type of energy? 
Well, they're composed of, the Koran says, smokeless fire. To me, that means plasma. In other words, they have bodies, but their bodies are very different than ours. In other words, the, the Koran says the God made the angels from light, photonic energy. You can equivalent that to. He made man and woman out of the mud and the clay, which means, you know, matter, molecules, and so on. And he made the jinn from smokeless fire. That would indicate a plasma, something in between matter and energy. So jinn, uh, for the most part, they can be seen as glowing masses, but, you see, since they have the ability to exist in this alternate dimension, they could be in a room with you, and you would not see them. Now, going back, yes, they can possess a body, but only if you really agree to it. Now, in another case, for example, a person was possessed by a jinn. This is in the Middle East. This is in Saudi Arabia. A person was possessed by a jinn. Now, they have a cleric come over because they really believe this stuff. The jinn is talking, yeah, I'm not leaving, heck with you. The cleric sits down, doesn't go through an exorcism like the Catholic Church will do, which is useless on jinn. The cleric will, will bargain with the jinn. How long do you plan to use that body? And the jinn will say, long as I want. No, that's not good enough. How about if we do this? You stay in the body for two weeks. After two weeks, you leave the body. The jinn will say, okay, that's an agreement, but if the jinn doesn't leave, the next step is to beat the body. You see, while the jinn's in the body, they believe the jinn feels pain, but the person whose consciousness is suppressed does not feel the pain. So they will actually get these whipping sticks and start whipping the body to cause the jinn pain, to cause it to leave. Now, according to what they believe, the jinn understands this. So if the jinn is caught and he's talking to the cleric, he will make a deal to keep the body for a certain length of time to experience certain physical pleasures and then peacefully leave. And they make the jinn swear, you know, by Allah, you know, whether or not the jinn believes in Allah or not. You know, that's academic. But the jinn knows that unless he leaves the body at a certain time, what's going to happen is they're, they're going to beat the body, and he's going to feel that, and he's got to get out of there. Let me ask you, Phil, um, how do you know you're dealing with a jinn? I mean, is it in every day, you know, in our society? I mean, could I be walking down the street and encounter a jinn and not know it, or how, how would I know? Well, they can take, they can take on physical form. And, they can, and, and according to, um, you know, the, in, in, in the Muslim belief, going back to the ancient Persian belief, they usually take the form of snakes and animals and things like that so they can walk in our world and be in our world on notice. But they can take the shape of humans. Now, one problem they have with keeping the shape of a human, the form of a human, is the eyes. They don't seem to be able to control the shape of the eyes, and the eyes will start to re resort to a yellow sort of thing with like a, almost like a reptilian sort of eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what they do in the Middle East. If they encounter a strange person, they look at their eyes. They, they actually pin him down for a while and watch his eyes to see if his eyes are going to change, and then he's a jinn. But today, of course, people wear sunglasses. So, you know, <laughs> how many people walking down the street with sunglasses are just covering their eyes? We don't know. Uh, also, how do you know you're dealing with a jinn in its, you know, uh, plasma form? First of all, they're very secretive. They're not going to tell you they're jinn. Some of them, after a while, slip up because they have egos just like human beings. And after a while, you see, a jinn will be more eager to have a conversation with you rather than and contact you and have some communication with you instead of just sneaking around or or growling and howling like a wolf or something like you see in some of these exorcism cases. The jinn will more readily have a conversation with you, and it will try to mislead you as to who and what it is. Most of the time, these are renegade jinn, and if they know if they're caught, they will be punished by their own kind. In, in paranormal investigation cases, sometimes it is hard to know right off the bat what you're dealing with, but we could make that statement about a lot of kinds of entities. You know, you, sometimes you have to 
assess things for a while before you get a handle on what exactly is going on. But um, uh, the gin can often act in ways... Literally dozens of books on the paranormal. Everything from ghosts to UFOs, vampires to witchcraft. Most recently, they have co-authored together a new book entitled The Vengeful Jinn, Unveiling the Hidden Agenda of Genies, which was just released in March and has already hit number one on Amazon's Hot New Books in Parapsychology. So please join me in welcoming to the program Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip Imbrogno. How are you both doing this evening? Very good, thank you. Keep it rocked. Keep it locked. Keep, 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 it, keep it, locked. it loud. Keep it loud. You are now no. listening to the Decca Dance Radio Network, the only radio with attitude. Well, let's get it started. We live in a world filled with the unknown. Ghosts and spirits wander through our physical dimension. Undiscovered creatures lurk in the shadows and strange lights and crafts seem to dominate our skies. Modern science refuses to acknowledge their existence, yet credible eyewitnesses are convinced these things are real, and it's up to independent researchers to search for the truth. Welcome to Unknown Origins Radio. Thank you, Mike. doing fine. Good. Well, thank you very much for coming on the program. And um, I have just completed reading your book, The Vengeful Gen, and... Uh, Mike, most people, I think especially most people in Western society, have not been very, you know, n not having a lot of information about the djinn growing up, other than what we know of from television shows like I Dream of Genie, you know, <laughs> and the blue djinn. And that, I mean, literally, that's all I ever. Gibbetson, and you're listening to another edition of Unknown Origins Radio. Tonight it's Sunday, April 24th. And I'm joined as usual by my co host, Lauren DePinto. How are you doing, Lauren? I'm doing great, Mark. And our producer, Carrie Ann Versace. Hey, Mark. How are you? Ah, doing good. We're going to go right ahead into this because we've got a, an excellent show for you tonight. Our guests tonight are longtime researchers, and between the two of them, have authored literally...